Today, the uncertainty principle squared. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Friday afternoon and Tarek Brooker is back with me. Hi Tarek. Hello Martin, how are you mate? Uh, pretty good. It seems to be that every day is like a year at the moment. It is crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah, it, it really is. You, you don't know what to focus on. Something's blowing up left, right and centre. And I, I tell you what, I had a time whittling down about 40 different graphs into, into the slideshow for this week because there's just so much going on. <laughs> and I reckon that whatever you've done, you probably will have missed something out because there, there <laughs> yeah. is there is too much to cover in even an hour long show. You know, our shows are pretty extended, but uh, uh, it, but it is very interesting how a lot of people now are finally getting the message from the Fed that the Fed is not going to pivot. Right, <laughs> finally. Um, but funnily enough, the markets went the other way last night. So crazy times. And of course, in the UK, well. You know what's going to go happen there with um, the uh, the Chancellor wishing back from the US to the <laughs> to the UK. Will he still have his job in the twenty four hours time? I ask myself. I I, I have no idea. That I can I really can't believe just how badly someone with I believe a doctorate degree in economics has managed to screw up so spectacularly when it's sort of pretty obvious that. When your currency is in a vulnerable position, your nation is in a vulnerable position, you've just committed to this enormous, you know, basically open-ended energy subsidy that you just then go off and go, you know what, let's do a bunch of unfunded tax cuts. I would have thought that, you know, something that, that, that you would have covered in like, you know, year nine business studies. Well, it's interesting that Rishi Shunat Sunak, who was the other candidate for, for prime minister, had warned as part of his campaign of the risks of going down precisely this route. So, I mean, you know, he was dead right. But what's interesting, because the markets, the markets are now saying, well, the Bank of England is going to remove its um, support for the uh, long term bonds. So they've put the 30 year bond back to where it was before the last two weeks. So. Actually, there's a lot of fragility there, and I keep reminding people that you know this this is not a small economy. This is you know one one of the very important economies in the world. So if that economy wobbles and if the bond market really goes you know south, that's going to have a huge impact around the place as well. And of course, the only winner will be an ever stronger US dollar. Indeed, and I think it's interesting that that Bloomberg covered yesterday and has been covering for a couple of days now the impact even here in Australia. Because we've seen we've seen British pension funds and finance and money managers selling off Australian residential mortgage-backed securities at some fairly sizable discounts of up to fifteen to twenty percent in order to meet these margin calls. So if this thing does really, really get disorderly, you could see some fairly sizable issues with particularly the non-bank funding market. Oh, it definitely is creating problems already here in Australia. I can tell you that. I'm looking at some of the uh, some of the data there. But the other, of course, the, what question I have is that you know over in Washington where they were, um, I wonder what behind the scenes conversations there were amongst uh, his relative peers, you know, and the, and the IMF and every all the all the other global hangers on, right? Um, because they must be shaking their heads, thinking, you know, whose side are you on? Yeah, well. I <laughs> They, they just they just haven't they haven't really really thought it through and I, I think that that's really a theme that we're that we're seeing at the moment because you know the Fed has to keep doing what they're doing they have to keep raising rates as last night's hot inflation report showed inflation is entrenched rather broadly and that's something that we'll get into in far greater detail later in the show but economies pension funds money managers they're not prepared for it this that they still seem to be running on this idea that the easy money will return and and soon but that's not what's that's not what's happening at the moment and if things keep going the, the way they're going it's not going to happen for quite some time no i think that uh, people should understand that interest rates will continue to rise and probably stay high for quite some time the inflation thing is not going to get crushed anytime soon one other quick observation which we'll perhaps touch on later but it's interesting that of course the property element of the US CPI is quite a lot bigger than the Australian one. Like we've sort of pretty much excised all property related stuff out of our CPI. 
Um, but they don't. So actually, it's quite interesting to see some of the differences in the way that CPIs are calculated around the world. So that's something a lot of people don't understand as well, that you know, CPI is not a standard metric that's used precisely the same in all, all places around the world. Yeah, I think that's really an important point because it, rents here in Australia account for less than 8% of the CPI. And rents are the only market-based component of, Australia, of, the, of Australian housing's contribution to the CPI. So basically, you know, you can have housing prices absolutely go to the moon, but it doesn't matter. You can even have rents rise significantly, but they're only, as I say, only seven, seven point something percent of the CPI. Yet in the US, shelter as a, as a component makes up 34% of the CPI. So rents and the equivalent of rent for people who own their homes makes up a third of it. So when people go, oh, Australian inflation isn't so bad, Take into, account, t- take into account the difference between Australian inflation and US inflation. And also the fact that our rental inflation is magically only 1.6% when CoreLogic, REA and SQM have it pegged at somewhere between 10 and 20%. Yes, of course, that relates to new rents. And the, the ABS argues that uh, they've got a portfolio that includes old rents, except that old rents turn into new rents <laughs> as people sort of uh, have to get the next demand through the door saying, your rent's gone up 15%. Um, but it is an important point. And of course, <laughs> the RBA was responsible for the reduction of the property segment into our CPI. Yeah, that was one of the arguments they made, right? No way. Shock, horror, probe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's it's just it's it's ridiculous. You know, the fact that we have the single biggest expense for home, you know, not for home, it's for people in general, being such an incredibly small proportion of the CPI is just ridiculous. I mean, let me put let me put it this way: the market-based components of housing on the CPI, which is AKA rents, isn't that far off the, the CPI weighting for alcohol. So basically, we've created this situation where booze is very nearly weighted in a similar way to rent. And that is just nuts. Because, and, and once again, that is the only component. So all these other increases in, in, in housing costs that we're seeing in terms of housing prices, well, they just don't factor in. No, and you know the reason that they argue why you don't want to include it is because of the feedback loop. Because basically, if you have all of that in, and interest rates go up or down as a result of it, that's going to impact the price of property, which means that you've got a feedback loop, right? But the problem is you've got a feedback loop now because basically <laughs> because you're undershooting on your inflation and therefore your inflation targeting's off because a great swathe of costs is not included, then basically they're without a compass anyway. So it's a completely species argument. It's because, of course, they're concerned about just how big a proportion of the overall economy the, um, the property-related sector is, and it would um, dwarf a lot of everything I say at the moment. Well, have a beer. It's the same price as uh, owning a house, clearly. <laughs> it, it's interesting that you, that, you, that you should mention that because I think, I mean, I, I've been curious and to, to ask you, have, have you seen any reduction in demand for these equity mate home, home equity withdrawals in your data? Well, it's quite interesting because the refinancing rate has gone through the roof. But guess what? A lot of refinancing is still drawing equity out, right? About one third of refinancing that I've seen in my surveys include equity, more equity. And that's partly to cover off other debts like credit card debts and partly because people want to sort of have a little bit of a buffer. So so some of these buffers that everybody keeps talking about is, is simply because people are still raiding the piggy bank. Wow. So is that is that roughly broadly similar with the sort of proportion of people withdrawing equity that, that you've seen over the last couple of years? Gone up. It's gone up. It's gone up. Yeah. Oh, gone wow. Up. <laughs> be, be, because, because the pressures are actually emerging, right, um, and, and a lot of people – so previously a lot of the equity withdrawals were thought of to chase property investments and those sorts of things, right? But now the motivation is to manage cash flow. So – it's a very different rationale. And uh, interestingly, of course, some of the people who are pulling the, the money out aren't people who've got loans recently. They've got loans quite a long time ago, which means that there's quite a lot of equity sitting in the property still. But it's a very artificial situation. And then, of course, they hold this money out in offset accounts and things. But it, it's still a problem, and it's still increasing the amount of 
repayments that people have to make. So this is another factor that's still not really coming to the surface. Now, you know, I don't know what you, whether you watched the APRA evidence earlier in the week, but I was disgusted. I actually made a show about it because I was so disgusted. Like, they, they don't know anything about what's going on. And they oh, well, you know, it looks all right in the world, but it might go wrong later. We're not quite sure. We don't have a lot of granularity. I'm thinking, well, no wonder we don't know where we are then. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know the feeling, mate. Like, some of my inspiration when I want to do an article or a Twitter thread, it's like, I've seen someone say something stupid, and here's why it's stupid. <laughs> exactly right. Well, we're not going to say anything stupid, are we? We're going to we're going to our slides now, and uh, let's get let's get going and um, go from go on. And I love the chart again. This this first one, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. There's plenty of them out there. It's just it's it's fantastic. Uh, as usual, folks, the charts are available at avidcom.substack.com. Big thank you to everyone who has subscribed, donated and made ongoing contributions. It all helps keep, keep the lights on while I'm doing all this other stuff. And without further ado, we'll get right into it. Now, the CEO of Alinta Energy came out recently and said that he expects that household energy costs are going to rise by about 35%. And he said that that was basically at a minimum baseline. And others have suggested, in, in particular, uh, your mate from Macro Business, Martin, that it could be significantly at a whole lot higher than that. But for the sake of argument, I've picked out that 35% figure and then extrapolated that in, into the CPI. I've also included rents, rental inflation feeding in based on CoreLogic's figures and on SQM's figures. Now, Alex Joyner from IFM did a rather interesting chart on this, which I believe I shared a few weeks ago, which basically shows that eventually the ABS figures will catch up with those of private providers. It will just take time. So what I've done here is taken inflation over the last decade and then added those particular inflationary pressures weighted at, at their current weight within the CPI, which is ironically, believe it or not, less less than 10% between them. But depending on whether you use the SQM figure or the, core, or the core logic figure, it will raise inflationary pressures in Australia by somewhere between 1.8% and 2.5% year on year. Which basically means if you extrapolate that over the last decade, we have only had, with the exception of the, the impact of the, the initial impact of the pandemic, we have had one CPI report, which would have been under the RBA's target. Yes, which goes back to what I said about well, what are they targeting in the first place, right? They're not targeting necessarily the right the right things, and uh, that of course means that our um, monetary policy, as well as being stupid, this is making it ultra stupid. Well, yeah, I mean, and I think that this illustrates things nicely because hmm. if you've got something that is less than ten percent of the CPI, these two factors, which are arguably already baked in by existing issues, if the people at the Linter Energy are correct, and the the traditional relationship between the private providers and ABS rents continues, you're basically already blown through a two thirds of the RBA's target all by itself. So even if you only have very moderate inflation in everything else, even if we have historic levels of inflation in everything else, we're still going to be above the RBA's target. And that's not including having any issues coming in from overseas, importing inflation, all that other stuff. So it really, I think, illustrates that no, we're not going back to, to, to low rates in a hurry. In these inflationary pressures are here for a protracted period. And if we do go back, which is admittedly possible, the RBA could do all, something all manner of stupid, there will be costs. Absolutely. And just to underscore, you know, the, one of the points you made was, well, we aren't encountering there any of the imported inflation, but with the exchange right now sitting at 62, whereas it was about 70 a few months ago, right, that is a significant skew to the downside in terms of the price of oil. So in other words, prices into Australia for oil are going to be up by 6 to 8% simply because of the exchange rate move, let alone everything else. And of course, the price of um, oil has gone up again as well. So there are so many inflationary pressures. And of course, we also import goods and services from all over the world. And with inflation running hot in other countries too, we're going to import those higher prices too. So the chances of getting back to a 2% target within the next three to six months, which is what some people are talking about, I think is a nice round zero. Yeah, you would to reach that in headline terms, you would need something to implode on a greater level than the financial crisis. So, yeah. <laughs> now, this is, I think, is a nice illustration of things because 
basically Australian wages in real terms are falling at their most rapid rate since the nine, probably the 1980s. And if you are, and this is based on the quarterly inflation report from the ABS. If you base it off the monthly inflation report from the ABS, which is admittedly preliminary, take with a bulk carrier worth of salt, et cetera, it's even worse. And I just want to just point out something in, in the sort of inflation debate in terms of what's, what it was like in the 80s, what it was like in the 70s, and what it's like now. In 1982, there was more real wages growth than there has been than in the 10 years prior to the pandemic. So I think that really just needs to be just taken into account when, when we hear these stories of people walking 97 miles in rags to buy homes. Real wages growth was rocketing, and that is what supported the property market. This time, real wages are being smashed into oblivion. Yeah, and just to make the other point, in the early 2000s where we had quite high interest rates, people were buying up property, there again, wages growth was actually quite strong. You can yeah. see it from the chart there, right? And that really allowed people to sort of get out of jail, but we're going in the other direction. And interestingly, I don't know whether you saw this, the RBA actually released under Freedom of Information some internal research on... Um, the cost of living and wages. And there was a big complicated debate in that FOI about what's the best way to measure wages growth, right? Because they were arguing that, well, the way we do it isn't necessarily a very good way, blah, blah, blah. But again, they also showed this this horrendous chart, which is that the proportion of growth over the last two or three decades has all particularly come from company profits. Isn't wages as a proportion has gone backwards. So in fact, <laughs> whatever way you look at it, we're being robbed. Yeah, and the thing as well is like ANZ came out with a good chart the other day and basically they showed that the wage increases that are happening are overwhelmingly flowing to the top 20% of workers with the next 20% seeing sort of decentish wage growth. And I think that that's a fairly sort of concerning picture because it's all well and good to go, oh, well, headline wage growth is X. It's like, well, what we're actually doing is we're averaging it out and a lot of for a lot of people, wage growth is still very anemic, yep. and while for others in high, you know, there's some of these high-paying jobs that are in high demand, you know, say for example, you've seen strong wages growth for lawyers, you've seen strong wages growth for, you know, some in in some segments of IT, but for you know, and and in 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 construction in certain sectors, but for the for the most of the rest of us, it's not so bright. No, it does um, show that this distribution across the income scale and uh, across demographics is really important. But there's very little of that done. Even the ABS attempts are pretty limited, I think. So, uh, and again, in my surveys, I see that. So, a lot of the pressure with regard to you know rental stress and mortgage stress is amongst households whose income is still going backwards. There's no real growth at all, and in fact, in some cases, no growth of any sort. Well, what do they say? Don't ask questions when you don't want to know the answer. Uh, indeed, exactly right. And, you know, it's a, it's a bit of the, uh, the, 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 the pale shadow of the UK, right, with their tax cuts for the very rich, you know. Well, let's let it cascade down, you know. The, uh, the crumbs off the table will ultimately percolate down to everybody else. Well, or not. <laughs> uh, this one's for our, Ki our Kiwi viewers and for our... People who are keen on look, looking at what's going on in the Kiwi housing market, Wellington is now down to more than 20%. The U overall, uh, prices continue to fall faster than the US housing crash, and Auckland's down almost 18%. It's still, it's still quite the mess. And I would also just, just throw in here, price falls did moderate somewhat in September. However, as I, as I wrote in a recent article, which I'll get, I'll, I'll send Martin the link to it and put it in, he can put it in the description or a pinned comment, seasonality matters. Of course, housing prices are going to fall more in winter than they are in the springtime, especially when so few houses are being brought to market. It's worth noting that with this, with, with this particular data release, there was also news that on a seasonal basis, Kiwi housing turnover collapsed to its lowest level in 12 years. So any moderation in price falls is because more and more people are just saying, no, no, not selling it, not selling it at that price. 
I'm, I'm, in, I'm pulling it from the market, etc. So, you know, take it, take it with a bit of a pinch of salt in that regard, especially for when, you know, Kiwis do, quite a lot of Kiwis do have short-term fixed loans and when those start to roll off, you'll see more pressure. And I just want to make a quick shout out for Jen Baird, who actually is in, in charge of the R9Z. Her monthly releases is an, F, an example of hopium like I've never believed, right? So they always manage to find a reason why there's a silver lining to the falls, right? So it makes it more affordable. Or there's, you know, for, for people who are prepared to meet the market, you can still, you can still just, I mean, it's amazing. So I did a show on my channel earlier on, which said, hang on a moment, look, look, look at this. Even she's getting a bit gloomy, right? That's the first point. The, the other interesting one, which I think is a quite an interesting one, they made a distributional point, right? A lot of the stuff that's being sold is now cheaper property. And that in, in turn is having quite an impact on the index and on the overall statistics. So when you take that into account as well, actually the falls probably, on average, are actually more significant even than they're reporting. So there's uh, no good news there. And, of course, um, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, oh, let's do 50 basis points just to uh, keep the pressure on and the, the more to come, they say, more to come. Yeah, and from from what I've heard from people in, in New Zealand who've taken who've, you know, who I'm thankful have taken the time to DM me on Twitter and, you know, share their firsthand experiences of it. You know, that, you know, I've, I've heard from people that some of these properties, particularly in places like Wellington, which are the hardest hit, are basically just going no bid. People are just not touching them with a 50 foot pole. So, you know, it's it's really being somewhat insulated just by basically this this collapse in in, in demand and turn in turnover. Yeah. But as the R and Z said, it's still a great time to go to auction. <laughs> Well, I wonder whether that's true. Well, at least the agents get get bigger fees if you go to auction, so maybe that's the reason. So, well, I will say for the REI and Z, I, the, their data is fantastic. Yeah, their da- their, their, that 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 monthly data release is just so amazingly detailed and free to the public yeah. Yeah, as well. I would very much like to see something similar made available here in Australia because the depth of data that the, the, the I'm not going to, you know, it doesn't have full granularity, but it's a hell of a lot better than, than the sort of easily accessible stuff we we have here. No, I agree. The, the data itself is very good. And the HPI, the, the, the Home Price Index as well, is, is quite useful just to make some comparisons. Uh, but I'm just a, a little bit um, sick of the sort of the hopium that sits over the top of it. But there you go. That's, I suppose, the <laughs> that's part, what, of, what, part, what of the part of the course in the Yeah, in well, I mean, it's, land, it's right? like everything, you know. It's, I, I don't know. I, I just, there's been all sorts of spinning of, of, of you know, Lie, damn lies and statistics recently. <laughs> now, this this is a nice illustration of what I was talking about in New Zealand, but this time in Australia, that I I actually spoke to the good people at CoreLogic recently, and they were and they were talking about how they were surprised that home new home listings are actually falling instead of rising, and historically, as you can see from you know the years of data that we've got on this chart, historically that they're meant to rise at this time of the year with seasonality, but that isn't happening. And that is part of why we are seeing better auction clearance rates and why we're also seeing price falls moderate because there's just less stock coming to market. So I think that all these people taking these, you know, these big victory laps that, that, that the market is going to bottom soon and all this other stuff, well, they really just need to look a at seasonality and b at the fact that that the that this particular factor is seeing support for the market, at least until we start to see more more mortgage stressed households start to put their properties on the market. Right, and I'll just make the other point, of course, that um, the most critical lever for price movements is availability of credit. Availability of credit is linked to interest rates, right? Because as interest rates go up, plus the three percent buffer you can borrow less. And now the average borrowing power is about 30% down from where it was before they started lifting rates. So there's very little chance, very little chance of property prices starting to turn up whilst interest rates are continuing to rise and with the borrowing power, unless, of course, APRA removes the 3% buffer. (laughs) I think they could well, they could, well, you know, it's unlikely they'll go much higher. So why don't we just take it back to 2% or something like that? So I don't know. But at the moment, um, I've I'm very sceptical of these people are saying, oh, well, we're going to see prices start to um, tick up early next year when the RBA starts cutting rates again. You know, Hopium, hopium, hopium. Yeah, I I don't see it, to be honest. Like, naturally, if the RBA somehow magically manages to do that, yeah, sure. 
it's possible. But what is going to create the situation that's going to take Australian inflation from 8% down to something resembling, an, an, you know, a level that they could reasonably justify cutting rates? Now, even if you see inflation de decline extremely quickly because of a crisis, we, it's, it's still entirely possible that, that we're going to see inflation be, remain at a level significantly higher than the RBA's target. So, you know, meanwhile, we're all getting our purchasing power destroyed with each passing month. Exactly right. And, of course, if they did start to uh, take rates lower, the exchange rate would go below 50. I'm, I'd, li I'd like to rule it out, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a very wise not to move it out. I mean, that is because, of course, they will argue that the flexible exchange rate provides protection for the economy. No, what it does, it means that you can actually have your spending power eroded even more. Oh, wouldn't that be fantastic at a time when OPEC's cutting oil production? I'm mm. sure it'll end perfectly. Exactly. Okay, now this is, this is a rather ironic one, but, you know, let's look at it anyway. Um, <laughs> this one's from the RBA, and basically it shows the rate of current expiring fixed rate loans and the projected variable rate of where they expect it to go. So congratulations with, for engaging in the TFF RBA. You're basically, you've basically created a situation where when people's fixed rate loans finish, their mortgage rate is going to triple. Well done. <laughs> and look, the point there is really interesting, right? Because, of course, the Federal Reserve announced that they're in negative equity at the moment, right? And the, um, the Eurozone, the ECB, is also worrying about the equivalent of the term funding facility because both in the US and in the Eurozone in Australia, all the central banks are now having to pay huge amounts of money back to the banks for all the money that they parked with the, with the r r central banks under their exchange equalizations or repo accounts, right? Because they completely muffed it. So it's crazy to think that around the world, central banks are now handing money direct to all the banks to bolster their profitability at a time when households are being squeezed and when mortgage rates are going to triple or worse. Yeah. Did you see the report from City today reported in the AFR that, that, they, that, in, that in their view it's likely that it will be required that the TFF and its $188 billion that, it, that the RBA gave to the bank, back to the banks, I should say, will be extended or in, other, or in some other way continued? And I was just flabbergasted. I mean, I'm not, I'm not at all surprised but just the fact, you know, they're just like, oh, but CBA is going to need to refinance its largest amount of debt ever in a single year. And it's like, well, maybe they should have thought of that in the first place. Exactly right. And it's interesting because in the, in the Eurozone, they're discussing what to do with it, right? And they're basically saying, well, maybe we should um, differentially charge different or pay different amounts for different amounts. So some of the smaller banks might get a bit more, some of the bigger banks less or something. So they're, they're trying to look at, at a way... But surely all the central banks, when they set these sort of TFF and equivalents up, should have thought about what happens if rates <laughs> go, go the other way. Or maybe they never thought they would. I don't know. But it's crazy, crazy. And taxpayers are picking up the tab and supporting the banks. I hope you feel good about that, Tarek. Yeah, no, I don't. But <laughs> the, thing, the thing that really gets me about the TFF is that it wasn't needed. No. Not for a nanosecond. You know, every, people, people say to me, oh, oh, but it, it was needed. It was needed. If it, it, You know, think about what would have happened to the financial system. No, I'm sorry. Bullshit. That's a complete load of crap. The TFF wasn't actually even enacted until long after rates, when I say enacted, I mean actually accessed by the banks and right. dollars started flowing from the RBA to the banks long after rates had already basically gone to zero. Mm -hmm. Yields had collapsed. Bank funding costs had collapsed to the lowest level in history. And then the RBA said, you know what? That's not enough. Let's make it even cheaper for people to borrow money. And then they've ended up creating this, frankly, idiotic fixed mortgage cliff. They're now having to, as you say, pay money to the banks. And they've created this stupid situation now where monetary policy doesn't work properly because they've, because they've got, to, got, got it to the point where 35 to 40% of mortgage holders now have fixed loans. So they've completely shot themselves in the foot again and again and again, and we're all going to have to be the ones who have to pay the hospital bill. Absolutely. And are those fixed rates, you know, they're going to hit next year, 
And uh, in some cases, people were sub 2%. Now they're going to be 4, 5, 6, or even 7%, depending on where rates are. And um, that's a bit of a shock. The other point, Tarek, is when you actually have to reset your fixed rate loan, the banks are now obliged to do a new credit assessment. Really? Yeah. Oh, hello and, there. And guess what? They'll have to do it on the 30% lower amount. That could prove interesting. Oh, it could, couldn't it? I mean, that could that could really, really put the cat amongst the pigeons and all. Of, I mean, especially for the, you know some of these people who took on... Um, you know, some of these loans, especially ones who, you know, with withdrawn equity, people who've taken on high LVR loans, you know, and especially with property prices falling, they're going to end up with proper, proper trouble. Yeah, unless APRA changes the rules and said, well, actually, we won't ask you to do a uh, another credit assessment. The one you did at the start is fine. I would bet money that would happen. <laughs> I think it's quite likely. But at the moment, they are meant to do a, a you know, another, because it's basically a reset, right? So interesting times ahead, and uh, like I say, these these are going to hit. And of course, it's a cliff because effectively you go directly from you know paying this to to paying this. So there's no sort of you know gentle move up. And interestingly, of course, an interest only loan, they are meant to actually assess it as a principal and interest loan in terms of the ability to repay. Well, there's another thing that probably <laughs> won't. <laughs> You know, it's like like during the pandemic, you know, everyone was like, oh, look, look, the number of loans in arrears has collapsed. It's like, yes, because they changed the rules. Correct. Ex exactly right. And, of course, we know that people are actually being asked to sell. You know, the banks don't want to actually start registering an uptick in terms of, um, you know, bad loans. So the way to do that is to get people to actually um, put the property in the market and sell it before they go bad. That's happening, and it's happening more and more in certain pockets. So, um, for all sorts of reasons, you can't believe the the um, you know the, the official figures in terms of the uh, the bad debt rates. I would also note that some of the bad the, the bad debt rates, you know, say the the spin index, mm. that is the cream 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 of the crop of Australian yes. mortgages. Only Absolutely. a tiny, Handpicked. tiny, tiny proportion yep. of Australian mortgages at the banks, not counting non bank lenders, but at the actual banks are securitized into residential mortgage-backed securities. So you are looking at the absolute top, probably 10% of mortgages, which they've very strategically picked for that purpose. And it's like, really, really, the top 10% are performing well. Oh, I'm absolutely shocked. Now, let me just go back to you, this chart that you put up, right? Because did you see on the bottom, it says sources, Bloomberg, RBA, securitization system, yeah. right? In other words, the RBA's expert data set you know that relates specifically to securitized loans mm. so all the rba modeling is based on that cream of the crop that you're just talking about well i didn't even notice that jeez yep. fun times ahead for people so Damn. this is what i get frustrated about so the rba keeps saying yeah we're doing a lot of detailed analysis and modeling and then you ask them so what are you looking at and the answer is they're modeling the securitized set of data and they've got quite a big data set, but it's it's all those hand-picked loans. So it's not giving them a fair market view. And APRA, going back to the APRA discussion the other day, APRA says we don't look at geographic concentration or different types of customers. Um, well, hang on a moment then. Who is? <laughs> what, are, what exactly do they do all day? I mean, you know, you're talking about a huge, huge organisation with, with enormous levels of resources. What exactly do they, do they do they do all day? I mean, clearly, I'm 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 in the wrong profession. I'm not getting paid enough for this, man. <laughs> well, I reckon they have probably long coffee breaks. And look, what they actually do is they go and talk to the banks, and they uh, make a note of what the banks tell them is going on, and then they say, "Well, the banks tell us that there's no, nothing to see here. Everything's fine." Well, um, you know, I, I had a good chat about the fox guarding the hen about the fox guarding the hen house the other day. He said everything was fine, then he spat out a feather, and everything was great. <laughs> Exactly. And that's the point, right? They don't do independent validation of what the banks are telling them, right? They're basically relying on the internal audits that the banks do and the audits that are done by the big four or five accounting firms who then sort of say, well, yes, of course, everything's fine, as though that's somehow objective and independent and therefore it's, it, it's validated. There is no internal controls that are actually validated externally. And that's true, by the way, also of the IRB capital weightings calculations that all the major banks are using, right? Nobody actually checks it. Wow. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know how to comment on that without getting myself into trouble, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. <laughs>
U.S. mortgage activity, number of people purchasing homes, collapses. Hmm. Not really surprising. Highest interest rates since 2008. So fun times ahead for the U.S. housing market. Isn't it now sort of above six, close to seven percent mortgage? Now? Yeah, I think I believe yeah. it hit. I, I think I saw on Twitter this morning that it hit six point three two for yeah. the Fannie Freddie index, and obviously others that are um, not outside of you know the, yeah. the public securitized system. Are so lot, lot some of them are knocking on seven plus. But, yes. Uh, yeah, the, the official one is well over six now. And uh, just to remind everybody that um, a year ago, the mortgage rates were below two percent. Yeah, it was about two, two, two point, two point something. Two but point two. Yeah, yeah, two point two, two point five. Really, yep. you know, just just sort of bounced around that sort of area. But yeah, it's it's not a it's not a pretty picture. Now, naturally, this isn't the same as the financial crisis because they don't have all these variable rate loans the way they used they the way they used to. But obviously, borrowing power has been enormously, enormously curtailed, more so even than here in Australia. So. Yeah, the, the the U.S. housing market is going to have a, a, a bit of a bad time in the in the months and years ahead if trends continue. And and you know what, Jerome Powell is happy about it. I know he wants it. He needs. It. He, he was talking the other day about needing to create a correction in the property sector. Can you imagine Lowe doing that? <laughs> I no, could just, I could. <laughs> there would, there, he would be. Yeah, he would be run out of the, the Martin. The thunderbolt would so come quickly. down from. Oh, I can I can just imagine Albo sending in the SAS. Just you know, not the moment he heard that, geez, he'd be gone. Yeah, oh. I'll, I'll just make one other point about the U.S. mortgage market. There are more um, less well-regulated entities making mortgage loans now than they were in two thousand and eight. Yeah, that's very so true. The the mix has changed dramatically. So whilst they may not have the same securitization pressures that they had back then. The quality of the books and the quality of the underwriting processes are very opaque. So a lot of those weren't actually stress test by the Federal Reserve. Stress tested. Yeah, yeah. stress test, right? Yeah. Because they only stress test the big guys. Well, these aren't the big guys. These yeah. are the people outside the core system. So uh, we will watch with interest as to actually how and when housing in the US and the mortgage lending in the US explodes. I think it will. Yeah, what what proportion of loans were flowing to non bank lenders this time? Because I remember, I remember reading that over the last couple of years, since maybe 2018, 2019, the number the number had more than doubled. Yeah, so it's it's you know, it's interesting because it depends on precisely look at it. But the last I saw was about thirty percent. Yeah, so a sizable proportion, and, and enough to make a hole, <laughs> <laughs> to say the hole. least. Yeah, exactly. And you only need a little, only needs a certain size hole, and the ship will sink regardless. Eight eight percent is enough. Eight, if eight percent goes bad, that's enough to kill the system. Yeah. So fun, <laughs> fun times ahead. Now, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, the job, the labor market's rolled over. The U.S. is going to get go into a recession real soon. Powell's going to pivot. Assets are going to go to the moon. Yada blah blah." I think this chart shows quite nicely why that isn't going to happen so as quickly as a lot of people think. Currently, there are 1.67 job openings for every unemployed person in the United States. Even if this rolls over in a big, big way, at the at, let's say it rolls over as fast as a financial crisis, we're going to be looking at well into next year before you start to see a, a, an impact on the labor market. So basically it needs to roll over quicker than during the financial crisis. So if something drastically goes wrong, yeah, sure. Sure, it could happen. It could happen. But then then you you've got the, the you, you've you you may have got your wish that Powell will pivot, but then you've got to deal with, with the consequences of the the calamity that causes the power, power to pivot in the first place. No, I noticed that one of the uh, the Fed governors came out the other day saying, well, you know, if things go really bad, we can always stop. Yeah. But I think, I think the real question is, is how badly does the things need to go? I think that the answer is, you know, the treasury market, the repo market, something very systemically, hugely important like that blowing up needs to happen for them to, to consider stopping. You know, I don't think that some of these smaller issues are really going to stop them and, and that they'll just do, you know, more targeted levels of support, perhaps maybe like the Bank of England has done. 
you know, okay, yes, they've turned the QE tap back on to a degree, but it's nowhere near what they did in 2000, in, in, in back in 2020. Yep. It's just, it's very, very targeted. It's very calibrated and tempering. Of course, um, Andrew Bailey put the cat among the pigeons in, earlier in the week saying, we're going to turn it off on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the one trillion um, pound pension community said, what? We can't, you know, we want it. Good. So they're still lobbying for it to be extended. It probably will a bit. But, but it's, I think it's very symbolic that Bailey's not saying it's going to be there for a long time. This was a very temporary, short, sharp problem. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think we may have said this the other day. You know, it's quite likely that we'll see other holes in the dike and they'll need to put a finger in the dike to try and stop it. And hopefully then, you know. But they, they I don't see how they can do the holus bolus stuff they did in 2008 or indeed through COVID. No, I, 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 as things stand, I agree. I don't think they can do that. I think that they're going to need to be a lot more targeted. I think we're going to see a lot more of, you know, what I term burnout economics, where you're going to see that you're going to see a contractionary, a con contractionary monetary policy in terms of continued rising rates, but you'll see QE at the same time in order to in order to protect the bond market. So basically, it's it's uh, the way I see it is that they need to save the sovereign. They need to save the sovereign's ability to borrow, but beyond that, this whole idea of the Fed put is gone for, for 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 the immediately foreseeable future yeah, i agree i think yeah i think that's right and uh you know like i said earlier on the federal reserve of course is now underwater in terms of assets and liabilities because of the way that the bond markets have moved against them so uh we have another central bank that's got a problem yeah well uh, the, the fed is the biggest of them all so you know if they if they really have a problem we've all got a problem <laughs> now Recently, the Bank of America came out with what is probably the most bearish forecast for the US labor market. They expect that as, as early as the very hot, late months of this year or the, in early next year, that we're going to start to see the US economy lose 175,000 jobs a month. Now, what I've done here is I've put it into perspective of when the US labor market would hit certain targets for what, what, is, what is called in Australia the NIRU, which is basically the neutral rate at which, unemployment, at, at which the labor market is no longer acting as a catalyst for higher inflation. Now, this is basically the equivalent of economic voodoo because it's, needs to, it's, it's very, very difficult to ascertain and it's... And it's even more difficult to measure in real time. But the, the estimates vary quite widely. The Congressional Budget Office in the US estimates that this that the neutral rate is 4.5%. PIMCO says 5%, 5 Deutsche says 5.5%, and the San Francisco Fed says it's about 6%. But even if we take the most sort of the lowest estimate at which the labor market starts becoming a neutral contributor to, to, to inflation. That's not going to happen until October this year. Sorry, in October next year, based on this estimate starting in January 2023. And if we go by the San Francisco Fed's estimate, even if this bearish scenario comes to pass, they're not going to reach that particular target until January of 2025. So I don't think that there is going to be fuel from the US labor market to get the Fed to pivot anytime soon. And that's what the data shows, even based on the currently the most bearish forecast. And again, uh, we had a couple of uh, Fed officials come out over the last few days saying unemployment has got to rise. Yeah. I mean, it is, for better or worse, the shock absorber. It yep. needs to rise. It's just the way things work. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't like it any more than you do. Personally, I think that this this should the fact that this exists the fact that we rely on un, using unemployed people as a shock absorber for inflation says to me that we should be a lot more generous to these people because they are actually providing a very important service to our economy and to our society by being unemployed as ironic as that may sound i agree well the whole economic foundation is misplaced isn't it because basically it they're cannon fodder, the unemployed, the cannon fodder for uh, trying to control the rest of the economy. <laughs> it, it shows you the 
limitations of the current philosophy that's driving what central banks are doing and how they think about it. It's, it's pretty shameful, really, but um, they are the casualties. Indeed, and I think that you know you put you put this together with the the inflation report, and it's just to me there is basically no real argument for a data driven Fed pivot without some sort of market meltdown in probably the next at least the next six months. Absolutely. Well, maybe we'll ask Credit Suisse about that. <laughs> and naturally, I will I will add an amendment to that that if something implodes, it's open season. <laughs> exactly. Now. A lot of people have said to me, inflation is all about supply chain issues. It's all about, you know, certain certain things like used cars and all these other things that are driving inflation. But if you actually look at the headline inflation figure, excluding energy, used cars, airfares, hotels, car rentals, and shelter, it made another new high last month. So as you can see, inflation is becoming more broad-based and expanding out from these things that were initially hit by supply chain issues and increased levels of demand. Yeah, and it's worth just underscoring, isn't it, that um, the breadth of inflation into the services sector and, uh, you know, into um, driven by the feedback from wages going up, because wages are growing, are growing quite strongly still in the US at the moment, um, is showing that it's deeply embedded. And it isn't just supply chain chain related now and of course it's worth remembering that um, fuel has dropped in the US from its peak a few months ago right and um, so there are actually some offsetting movements but nevertheless core inflation still going up yeah highest level in 40 years yep. everyone I wrote an article on this back in back in August I'll get you to whack it in the description I said that core inflation was going to re-accelerate. Re People said that I was a dickhead. They said, oh, this is all just about the housing market, blah, blah, blah. Well, look, look, I was I was 100% right. And now everyone's crapping themselves because they're like, well, you mean inflation didn't peak and it can look like a peak and it's not a peak? So now <laughs> even the Fed are just like, well, even if it looks like it's peaked, we really need to be really, really careful because it could just resurge again. And that's a really, really important point because now the Fed has been saying recently, we've really got to see this grounded and stay grounded. So we're not going to preempt, you know. So, so a lot of people say, well, you've probably done enough. It's just going to take time to work through. No, 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 no. You've actually, they now say, we want to see it. We want to see it embedded and grounded before we actually start taking the, um, the rates in the other direction, which again... I keep saying this, it's higher for longer. Higher for longer is now the, the maxim. And I, I actually feel that the markets have now started to understand that. But it also puts Australia in context because our RBA has you know, probably um, done 25 when they should have done 50. It's going to be very hard for them to do a 50 now because if they do that, put the, the cart well and truly ahead of the horse. Um, but they probably are actually now getting very worried because with all this inflation happening elsewhere around the world, it's also happening here. They just aren't seeing it yet. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're on a lag. I believe mm. it was Shane Oliver from AMP who made that point that we're all lagging by about six, six to nine months. Mm. And I think it's just kind of nuts because even if you look at market pricing for the, uh, for the RBAs, uh, for the cash rate, in the US, market pricing is now for a 4.5 to 4.75% US rate by year end. And the market rate here in, in Australia is 2.9. That's going to be an absolutely huge, huge spread between the cash rate and the Fed if that comes to pass. And that's going to put significant downward pressure on the Australian dollar because we're all, if you actually look at a spread between US two year bonds and Australian two year bonds, Australian two-year bonds are lagging their US counterpart by very nearly the largest amount ever. Okay. Yep. So if you add another, you know, 60, 70, 80, 100 basis points on top of that, we're not going to have a fun time. That's right. And then we'll just overlay briefly the China factor because, of course, China continues to look weaker. We're going to get some more data, I think, uh, today on, on China. Um, but we're so reliant on that particular axis. And uh, if that continues to weaken, then that's going to put further pressure on the Aussie economy. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see this playing out. I noticed that the ASX 30 is still talking about 
of 4% or just below 4% the end of next year into the following year into 2024 as, as where the, uh, the cash rate will be. Um, but it's moved around, right? If you, if you look at the last two weeks, it's gone from three and a half to over four and then up and down all over the place. <laughs> Nobody really knows where this is going to end. No, and I think it's also worth noting, just, saying, just as you mentioned about how it's moving around, previously we was like about say six, seven weeks ago, it was pricing in a peak in rates around about sort of May-ish next mm. year. Then it was September. Now, the there. last one I saw, yeah, is now that we're not saying it's not, it's not pricing in the peak in rates until February of 2024. Correct. So, yeah, it's I just I just feel like some people be careful what you wish for. Okay, the RBA isn't hiking as aggressively, but now the market is expecting them to hike for longer and keep rates higher for longer, and that's something that's been echoed, I believe, by the research team at ANZ. Yeah, absolutely. Now they have, and uh, you know they're still calling. Yeah, I think 3.6 or something is the sort of or give or take. I always get muddled up between Westpac and ANZ, but they're both more bullish. As CBA is still a below three, <laughs> you know, I can hope, I suppose. But no, the market is saying, as you say, higher for longer. And, uh, you know, they only run it out that far. So you, you wonder how, how much for it's going to go. And, of course, everyone's hoping for those rate to uh, drops and therefore mortgages to come down and home prices to start picking up again but it's all contingent upon where rates are going to go and the the best bets are rates are going to stay high for at least another two years or so that's i think worth just thinking about well it's going to be interesting one way or another i'll put it that way (laughs) now i think this is a this is a really nice illustration of how the divergence between Goods and services inflation in the US is playing out. Now, if you look very closely, if you look there at the start of 20, at the start of 2021, that is when goods inflation peaked at an annual, at a three month annualized basis at more than 25%. But now that's come down from 25% down to 2.9. So that illustrates that that is when we saw the peak of these supply chain driven inflationary pressures and that they've since come off the boil. So this whole idea that it's all supply chain issues, it's still supply chain issues, no. It is now spread into services and into the broader economy, and that is a big, big problem. Absolutely. And, uh, of course, that's all because the wages spills over into services because a lot of it's people. Yeah, exactly exactly right. So, you know, I think that, that that really needs to be taken into account because, you know, so many people just keep saying, oh, the, the, once the supply chain issues, once the supply chain issues. Yes, I think that I think that, that they are correct, that there will be a degree of goods deflation in a lot of different sectors. That's something that I wrote about back in April when I talked about um, the, the level of inventory bills when everyone was still going on about goods inflation. So I, I do see that that will happen, but it's something that's going to... That, but is it going to be enough to offset the increase in services inflation and OPEC raining on, on everyone's parade with hot, with higher oil prices? Not any time soon. No, I tend to agree. Yeah, We're in interesting, interesting water. Indeed. Now, a, a few weeks ago, I made a YouTube video on my very own YouTube channel after being inspired by our, our good mate DFA analyst here. And... <laughs> And um, I basically just do short little videos on, you know, different, when I say short, I mean really short, three to five minutes on various different topics that that I think are interesting. And I mentioned recently that US healthcare costs were going to take off because they have been relatively benign, shall we say, since the pandemic because of various subsidies afforded to private providers by the state, by the federal government in the US, by counties who had, who was swimming in cash because of COVID and all the relief measures that the Biden and Trump administration sent through. But now those things are fading. Medical care, medical costs are taking off. So we saw the largest ramp up in US medical costs in a month since 1982. So this is really well and truly worth watching because in the CPI, medical costs are below 10% of the overall CPI. But in the PCE, which is the one that the Fed prefers, and I, I believe Jerome Powell personally prefers as his inflation metric, healthcare is about 20% of the overall slice of the pie. So if this continues to accelerate, it could it could look even worse 
than the core CPI if this trend continues. Absolutely. And there's another factor just worth mentioning briefly in the numbers. The um, They were subsidising uh, school meals for a lot of kids in the US, and now they've taken that out. So the cost of school meals went up dramatically, which is one of the reasons why that element was higher this time as well. So it shows you that some of the earlier protection policies, as they unwind them, is having an inflationary impact. Yeah, exactly. You start removing the distortions or... You know, and you know, to quote Warren Buffett, once you start taking that tide out, you see who's swimming naked. Exactly. Now, this is a this is a nice one of just basically how the core you must have drivers of inflation are performing. So food, shelter, medical care. You can see here how they've just absolutely taken off and how generally speaking, these are the largest drivers of, of inflation all on their own. If you look back to, to the times of pre-COVID. So I think that I think that it's just Im, Im, important to, to keep in mind just how how embedded this type of inflation is and how hard it is to kill. Because if you take a look here at well, you can you can see the chart. I don't need to point at it. Um, even at between you know when the when you saw the largest deflationary impulse in the broader CPI, you can see there just how little this came down. This particular factor only decreased by about 25% during the massive, massive shock of COVID. So if this only reduces, say, hypothetically by 25%, just by itself, not counting all the other core inflationary pressures, it declines by 25%, you've still got 3% inflation just based on this. And that's well above the Fed's target. So yeah. I don't know what people are thinking about this whole everything's going to be chunky-dory soon. And just to re-emphasize, we're talking here the dotted line, right? That's the critical one to look at. And you can see it's really, really coming up to, as you say, almost being in line with the headline now. So it's a bit of a worry, that. It is. Okay, and I believe this is the last chart for this week. And this is sort of preempting an argument that I absolutely know is coming. This, this month saw US rents decline for the first time since the end of 2021. And loads and loads of people are already jumping on, oh, this is going to cause the Fed to pivot, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. And, but as you can see, it's driven by seasonality. It's always driven by seasonality. Every year, it's the same thing. You know, well, sorry, not every year, with the exception of 2021, when you were seeing this enormous inflationary surge. But even in 20, at the end of 2021, you saw the seasonal weakness in December. And September, you, you see, seasonal weakness because US rents ramp in the first half of the year before coming down the second half. It's what always happens. But I guarantee you, you are going to see article after article, talking head after talking head, talking about how, how housing inflation is going to come down and everything's going to be hunky-dory in a nanosecond. I guarantee it. <laughs> well, they're looking for every little signal, aren't they? That's the point, really. Every little signal that they can try and justify the Fed pivot. I mean, I... I it's like lemmings, right? They sort of see a little sign over there and they all rush off in that direction. Oh, hang on, no, that, no. Oh, what about that? And they rush off a dip. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't know how many articles are just spruiking the same story, but they'll keep looking for the, you know, the pivot, the pivot signal. But actually, as we said earlier on, I don't think there is a pivot signal unless something really breaks dramatically. Yeah, no, I, I concur. I mean, yes, eventually inflation will come down to a... You, you will start to see the Fed get. You, you will start to see the Fed get the federal funds rate above the rate of core, in, core inflation, whether mm. that's PCE or, or CPI. That will eventually happen. Now, you know, you will see things come off the boil, and that will occur. Congratulations, you've got you, you, you've got four you've got four percent five percent Fed federal funds rate. Great job. Now what? You know, even if you do have a, even, the thing that interests me as well is that even if you do have a recession, even if something breaks and something implodes and the Fed does cut rates, are they going to cut them back to zero or are they going to cut them back to 3% or 2.5% or 2%? Because they still need to fight inflation. They can't just leave it alone at, at, at you know, at anything approaching the current level. And as the core inflation data and the accelerating inflation and all these key unavoidable components of the CPI illustrate that's going to be really, really hard to kill, even, even under the even under the worst possible economic circumstances we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. No, and there's two other factors. One is, of course, that now migration is hotting up all over the place. I mean, it's hotting up here in Australia. We've seen migration stronger now, and it will be even stronger ahead. But also 
New Zealand's doing it, other countries too. So that's going to have a significant um, impact in terms of what's going on. Um, the other, of course, is that we still have Europe, which is very troublesome, and I think will be troublesome for a long, long time, particularly because of the Ukraine connection as well as the, um, the broader issues there. And though the ECB is putting rates up, they're <laughs> doing it a bit gingerly. And then we've got China. So, you know, so even if my point is, even if the Fed manages to get the inflationary pressures turned down a bit in the US, economically speaking, there are plenty of other issues out there still actually, you know, with the ability to trip us up. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like, I, I literally haven't covered basically, you know, 75% of the world oh. during during this, this slideshow. And there is a plenty, plenty going on in all those different places. And I mean, as you say, like, you know, China has all manner of problems. Europe has all manner of problems. These problems are not going away in a hurry. And I think that, you know, even, even looking at things from a more bullish perspective, let's say China does do a stimulus. Great. Now China's doing a stimulus and, rate and, and ramping up commodity prices. I mean, I just feel like saying to people, do you want to take a look at what China did to commodity prices in 2007 yeah. and 2008? Yeah. It's not a pretty picture. Do you want do you want iron ore prices to go up five hundred percent? Okay, yeah, Australia will probably benefit from that, but I don't think China can afford that now as they did in two thousand and eight. I just I don't I don't think that the capacity is there to to to, to repeat that. But if they do try, it's going to send inflation to the moon. But you know, who knows? <laughs> and I guess that's the message, really. You know, there are there's so many variables in play at the moment, and we've touched on a few here, and you know, clearly ones that are very important. But there are lots of other externalities as well. And that's why this is so complicated. And somebody actually, um, I saw after the uh, CPI print came out, said, you know, this is a good, a good warning, right? Economists should be humble, right? There are so many variables. There are so many interacting forces. It's impossible to know precisely how this is going to play out. Yeah. And <laughs> that's part of why, you know, we've, for, for, for me, myself, I just... If I get it wrong, I just go, you know what, guys? I got it wrong. Mia culpa. But that's that's one of the problems with economists. They get it wrong and they just go, oh no, 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 no. You know, oh, this is this this shouldn't have happened this way, and I'm I'm right, and all this other nonsense. And you know, I, I see it, you know, in some of these takes on inflation today, you know, that you know, all these people that just think that certain countries that I'm not going to name are somehow going to be immune to all these pressures and that everything's going to be hunky dory. And it's just no. <laughs> What what evidence do you have for that? Yeah, well, you know, it shows you, I think, Tarek, just how much variability there is in, you know, in what's going on, a lot of uncertainty. Um, I'm not sure that central banks are really are across all of the, all of these things. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a good stab at trying to sort of explain to people what some of those issues are. And I'm pleased to say that in two weeks' time or so when we do the next one, There'll be more to talk about because <laughs> things will be shifting further. The sands of time, the sands of econ economics and the sands of, uh, you know, rushing around uh, central banks and central bankers and what they're doing. It'll be very interesting. So we'll do it all again next time, huh? Yeah, sounds good, mate. But like, as you say, I'm sure plenty will have transpired by then. I mean, maybe something might have even blown up. Who knows? <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it past anybody to see something big you know, watch the bonds, watch the liquidities in the bond section of the market, because at the moment, that's what I'm really interested in. There's a lot of um, stuff going on below the waterline. We've got a number of banks that are actually in difficulty, a number of central banks that are actually in negative equity, which, you know, is theoretically important, but practically not. But nevertheless, you know, it's hitting real households and real businesses around the world. That's why this is so important. Tarek, thank you very much. We'll do it all again next week. Yeah, no worries, mate. I'll see you soon. See ya. Take care. Bye, mate.